Okay, this video is what does Goldilocks and the Three Bears have to do with brain health? Uh, this painting right here of Goldilocks is by Scott Gustafson. He's the best of the artists for painting images from the fairy tale stories. So Goldilocks, you know, she went and she wandered in the woods. She was lost. She found the bear's house and she tried to find the right bed. The one that wasn't too big, wasn't too small. It was just right. One of the porridges was too hot, one was too cold, one was just right. And we're going to talk about getting your blood pressure just right. Otherwise, you end up uh, causing brain damage. So here's Papa Bear, Mama Bear, Baby Bear, and Goldilocks. Okay, here's what it all comes down to. In your brain, you've got the internal carotid artery, the ICA, comes up, it bifurcates. This is the middle cerebral artery, usually called the MCA. These are the branches to the deep... Um, tissues of the brain called the basal ganglia. So this is basal ganglia level below the lateral ventricles, which, you know, is shaped like the letter C on its side here, or the letter U. Okay, well, anyways, these small arteries, lenticulostriates, feed the basal ganglia part of the brain. And if you have really severe high blood pressure, it'll shear off the origin of these arteries and cause a hemorrhagic stroke in the basal ganglia. Um, I see those quite often. Then the middle cerebral artery continues on the convexities of the brain. Convexity because they're convex outward. And then they give off these little penetrating arteries that go down into the brain parenchyma. <clears throat> I drew a skull and crossbones here because this is the most common area of what are called silent strokes or small strokes. Um, this is the level, it's called, uh, the, this level right here, the level of ventricles, we'll just call it the radiata. Above the ventricles, we'll call that centrum semiovale because it's in the center and it's shaped like an oval. Okay. Um, so what happens is if your blood pressure is too low, you don't get enough blood coming up over the top of the brain going through these deep penetrating arteries, and it's called an N artery territory, meaning that there's not very good collateral circulation, meaning that if you don't get the blood from the vessel you're supposed to get it from, there's often no cavalry to come along and save that brain. So you're screwed if your blood pressure is too high because you have a tendency towards hemorrhagic infarcts. You're screwed if your blood pressure is too low because you will uh, not be able to perfuse the deep white matter area here. Now people say, oh, well, my blood pressure is, you know, 90 over 60. Should I be worried? Well, if you're totally healthy and you feel good, then it's fine. So as long as you feel good, a low blood pressure can be a sign of very good health. In communities where people eat plant-based diets, they'll have the same blood pressure as teenagers as they do in their 70s. So it will be normal for them to have a pressure of something like, you know, 100 over 60, 90 over 60 even. All right. But if your brain's used to, you know, 170 over 110 and all of a sudden it goes to 90 over 60, now that would be too low of a pressure for that particular person. Okay. Uh, but in general, you want a low blood pressure, a low normal blood pressure. Okay. Now, just real quick, a picture of the brain. Here's a normal brain. This is a flare sequence, meaning that the cerebral spinal fluid is suppressed. It's low, it's dark on this uh, MRI. It's called a flare sequence. Here is an abnormal brain MRI. These are the ventricles, cerebral spinal fluid in the ventricles. And here is the uh, periventricular white matter. has got tons of these hyperintense lesions. And these are all strokes. And like I said, we can count these real fast. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. At least 22 strokes. And if you really wanted to be more precise, there's probably about 30 of them in there. You know, if you consider this, this separate from this, from this, from this, from this. Okay, it just depends on how you count them. I think you get my point. This is routine for me to see brains that look like this. I see brains that look like this all day long, every day. Um, some people would even say for a 70 and older person, this is a normal brain. No, no, no. This is very, very abnormal. I would read this as extensive juxtaventricular, periventricular, and subcortical flare hyperintensities, most likely due to small vessel atherosclerotic ischemic disease, okay? And I realize I actually think it's related, of course, to what I'm talking about here, primarily actually due to overtreated hypertension. I think that's the most common cause of it because they're not getting enough blood up to the brain. The reason why blood pressure goes high in the first place is to get blood to the brain. When you're standing up, the highest spot to pump blood to is your brain. Okay, perhaps the top of your head. Okay, but let's just say your brain. And some people even think that's part of why Asians are becoming more bald now because they're eating higher fat diets and maybe they're not perfusing the top of their head so well. But baldness and hair loss is a different thing than brain ischemia. Okay, I'm kind of bald, but I think my brain's working just fine. All right. Um, hair loss, you get into genetics, you get into shampoo types, you get into all kinds of things when you start talking about hair loss. So we're not going to go there. Okay, 
We'll talk about that some other time. All right, but the point for today is that the typical American that eats a standard American diet, I start seeing these things routinely after 55, and I often see them in the patient's uh, 40s and 50s, early 50s, okay? Uh, this is all very bad. This is a disaster. This is a destruction of brain tissue, and sooner or later, the person's going to have a major uh, cognitive impairment or motor deficit. Okay, here's just to show you some bleeds. This is the center of the brain, the basal ganglia level. We're sort of below the main part of the ventricles. And you can see these uh, big round uh, black dots. Those are uh, cerebral microbleeds from hypertensive hemorrhagic lacunar infarctions. The one thing, though, that becomes quite interesting is you'll see there's a lot of smaller spots out in the periphery. And those are also called microbleeds. And people will tell you that central microbleeds are due to hypertension, hemorrhage, lacunar infarctions, small local infarctions. Lacuna means hole, like a hole in the brain from tissue being destroyed by a stroke. Okay, and they typically will call the peripheral ones as being due to what is called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is a subtype of Alzheimer's. And the point I'm going to make to you, I've seen many thousands of these, is that they all go together. I routinely see brains where it's in both locations, centrally and peripherally. I'll also sometimes see young people who just have hypertension but not any type of Alzheimer's or amyloid angiopathy and they'll have a bunch of microbleeds in the periphery. So I don't think the books are that accurate when it comes to this subject. And I actually think hypertension is the main driving lesion. I think the so-called diagnosis of cerebral amyloid angiopathy is overrated. And the same patients that got microbleeds either centrally or peripherally have an increased incidence of bleeds in their eyes due to hypertensive retinopathy. They go together. Okay, well anyways, um, a bigger sudden bleed like this one right here in the right basal ganglia. This is on a CAT scan, also called a CT scan. These patients are often so suddenly ill that they go just to CAT scan. They might not even get an MRI. They might be too sick to get an MRI. Okay, so this big white spot is a big intraparenchymal hemorrhage, IPH. Now these little tiny white spots, those are actually calcifications and one of the clues is they're so small and they're bilateral symmetric. Um, also this right here is calcification of the pineal gland which is super common. I see these normal variant calcifications. We call them normal variant. I don't actually think they are normal variants. I think they're due to destruction of tissue. That's just so common that we consider it normal. Bilateral basal ganglia calcifications and pineal calcification. Okay, so what's it all about? It's about protecting your brain tissue. Here is your hippocampus, your memory center for declarative memory, you know, things that you could talk about, you know, remembering episodes in your life. All right, this gray matter ribbon tracing the outline of the brain is called the cerebral cortex. Cortex means bark, like the bark of a tree, and that's where the cell bodies are. Uh, this deep matter here is the deep white matter. That's where the axons are, okay? Cell body is where the nucleus is, all right, of a cell. Okay, so we'll quick talk about the deletory theory, Jack deletory. And he says the most common cause of dementia is chronic cerebral hypoperfusion. All right, so he did his work by tying off the carotid artery in a mouse. Middle-aged and older mice, two months later, would be demented. He did autopsies on them, did not find a stroke, just saw an atrophic shrunken brain. That means they're losing brain cells by apoptosis, programmed cell death, which is a gradual process. So the neuron recycles itself. And you can't tell from looking at a brain MRI. All you can see is atrophy. Uh, you can't tell even from a microscope. You just see a relative lack of number of cells. So chronic cerebral underperfusion, the cell recycles itself so its organelles can be used by another cell. In comparison, if you had a sudden block, as let's say both carotids and the brain had a severe sudden drop in blood pressure, then you'd get a massive stroke, meaning complete cell death rapidly. And that would just cause a big mass, a big mess as the cells would lyse their plasma membranes. And you would be able to point to that with your finger on a, on a brain MRI exactly where it was. Okay, so what a conclusion that he came to is that Chronic decreased blood pressure to the brain is what causes cognitive impairment. And by the way, I know if you open up a book or you, you'll hear, oh, Alzheimer's is the most common dementia. By the way, I think that's nonsense. And the reason I say that is, okay, you want to diagnose Alzheimer's. What's the key historical finding that you can ask the patient, the question, or their family about the patient? There is none. What's the key physical exam finding that diagnoses Alzheimer's? There is none. What's the key blood test that diagnoses it? There is none. I know they're working on some new tests like PTAW and some other things, for example, but they're still not that well uh, solidified and accurate. Okay, now what about imaging? They'll say, oh, atrophy of the medial temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. It's not that accurate. I look at thousands of brains for cognitive impairment. I sell them 
see that. Okay, the nuclear medicine tests, they're a little bit better, but they're still not that accurate. Normal people can have lots of amyloid, okay? And the symptoms correlate better with uh, neurofibrillary uh, tangles, the, the tau, phosphorylated tau that's intracellular than they do with the extracellular beta amyloid protein senile plaques, okay? So I go through that all because what I'm basically telling you is they can't even confidently diagnose Alzheimer's that well at autopsy, okay? Because normal people can have tons of this beta amyloid as well, like over 33% of them. So what am I trying to say? The whole Alzheimer's thing is a bit of a joke. You can't effectively diagnose it while the patient's alive or when they're dead and you can't treat it. Doesn't that sound kind of like a joke? <laughs> if you can't diagnose it, how do you know it's real? All right, and then the other thing, this guy Delatory is real smart. He says, look at the risk factors for Alzheimer's. Diabetes, high blood pressure, obesity, <laughs> atrial fibrillation, um, atherosclerosis, impotence, high fat diets, smoking, alcoholism. Those are all risk factors for atherosclerosis and hypertension, okay? Well, if the two diseases have the exact same risk factors, maybe they're the same disease. You can also throw in there for dementia. And now we're just talking about dementia in general, not necessarily Alzheimer's. You know, traumatic brain injury, okay? All right, well, anyways. <laughs> What else can give you this? Because other people tell me, well, you know, how many people have a completely occluded carotid? Not that many, and that is true. How many people have severe stenosis of the internal carotid artery? Let's say more than 70%. Not that many. Well, then how could that be such a big cause of dementia? Because there's other causes of chronic cerebral hypoperfusion in adults that are very common. The most common one is overtreated hypertension. That's why I would be more scared of low blood pressure than high blood pressure in the context of overtreating hypertension. Not if your blood pressure at baseline is low. And you feel good. Okay, so anyways, um, what else will do it? Atrial fibrillation. You lose that atrial filling, that atrial kick. Chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, like the mouse. I call them a mouse equivalent. Congestive heart failure. The heart doesn't pump well. Chronic cerebral hyperperfusion, Mouse equivalent. How about um, aortic stenosis? Aortic, you know, cardiac aortic valve disease or aortic regurgitation of the of the aortic valve. Chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, Mouse equivalent, like the mouse. You're, your brain ain't getting enough blood, ain't getting enough oxygen and glucose. Post-cabbage hypotension. So cabbage is CABG, coronary artery bypass graft. That means open heart surgery with a, a grafted bypassed artery. And like I stayed in the ICU with my father when he was when he underwent that many, many years ago. And they ran him like 85 over 60. I couldn't believe that. I thought he was going to have a stroke. I, I called the anesthesiologist. I said, what's going on here? And he said, well, it's because we don't want him to bleed it as anastomosis and he seems to tolerate it well. But it made me quite nervous. I think my dad was a lot healthier than the average cabbage patient. But that's enough to scare the bejeebus out of you and make you not want to open heart surgery. Because a lot of patients don't have that good of blood supply to their brain. And I think they're at much higher risk to get so-called pump head. Uh, meaning that post-cabbage uh, cerebral hypoperfusion and cognitive impairment. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about three, the two major patterns of atherosclerosis. There's a typical Westerner atherosclerosis from eating a high-fat diet. They get a lot of atherosclerosis in their internal carotid artery origin. This is the common carotid artery and external carotid, internal carotid artery. That's where you see atherosclerosis all the time in internal carotid. Most people I look at on CT angiograms of the brain will have some right there, especially the older ones, the more sick ones. There are a lot of people who have a normal internal carotid. I have to grant that. Okay, the coronary arteries proximally, you routinely see these arteries heavily calcified and people get a lot of plaques in these areas. All right, well, this is your high-fat diet Westerner, okay? And here is your East Asian or Japan pattern of atherosclerosis. These patients eat low-fat diets. They used to eat almost entirely white rice, okay? But then they'd also eat a lot of vegetables. But what gets them in trouble? Well, they were eating very high sodiums. They were quite often eating sodiums of 12 grams or more a day. Humans only need to eat about 200 milligrams a day. So 12 grams is a ton of sodium, all right? And they're also smoking like chimneys. That'll also cause hypertension. So these patients would get intracranial atherosclerosis, and they had a very high incidence of strokes. But still, the Japanese were among the longest-lived people in the whole world, and things worked out for them reasonably well. All right, so anyways, those are sort of like the two main patterns of atherosclerosis, extracranial atherosclerosis, intracranial atherosclerosis. If you've got those things as a baseline, then you're at higher risk to have a problem if you overtreat your hypertension. So like I said, really high pressure. You'll have a tendency to shear these vessels at their origins and get little bleeds into the basal ganglia. We call those hemorrhagic lacunar infarctions. Lacunar means like a hole, hole in the brain. People who overtreat their hypertension, atrial fib, they'll often get these silent strokes. And by the way, these silent strokes are super common. I'll see many thousands of them for every one uh, hemorrhagic lacunar infarction I see down here. Okay. 
But this is the skull and crossbones because lots and lots of people overtreat their hypertension. Lots and lots of people got congestive heart failure, atrial fibrillation, or something like related to that. Oh, and I guess that's all I had for that presentation. So anyways, I hope that's helpful. And so what I basically showed you is I think it's more dangerous to have your pressure abnormally low uh, due to overtreating hypertension than to have it just a little bit high because you don't treat to that low of a threshold. So what's the point of this? Like McDougal said, he doesn't immediately treat hypertension if somebody just comes into his office. He gets a couple measurements at home, makes sure their pressure is pretty high. I think, you know, 150 or something was his baseline on whether or not to treat. You can watch his lecture to get his exact numbers, but the point I'm making is you don't want to overdo the treatment of hypertension or you could drive people into chronic cerebral hypoperfusion and cause um, brain damage from that. Okay, and understanding all of this will help you to later on understand when I go into my theory of neurovascular coupling. Um, and, you know, just avoiding all your atherosclerotic risk factors keeps you in good shape. So what was the whole Goldilocks business? It meant that you want to keep your pressure where it should be. And the best way to do that is eat what you're supposed to eat. Low fat, low sodium, whole food, vegan diet, 100% plant-based, 100% organic, no oil, no sweets, no uh, alcohol, no tobacco. That's how humans are made to eat and to live. Like I said, you want to live like Adam and Eve, but with indoor heating and plumbing. Um, and then you keep the Goldilocks balance. Your, your body is a genius at regulating your blood pressure and your nutrient absorption and all that. It's just your job is to give it the right food, you know. So anyways, hope that was helpful.